This is clearly a targeted attack. Annalisa was a beautiful, stunning woman. Anybody that spoke about her always spoke about how nice she was. She was stabbed in the face, in the neck, and in the chest. Who could have been this vicious to do this to this woman? The word was that this was probably something she knew. This is about winning and losing to people like this. I knew that he was lying to us about something. Clearly, there was so much more going on. We just had to figure out what it was. Hello? Every day in North America, dozens of people are murdered. The key to solving the toughest of these homicides lies in the final 24 hours of the victim's life. To crack the case, detectives must reconstruct that critical timeline. The minutes and hours containing evidence that can help unlock the mystery and catch the killer. just 34 miles northeast of wealthy Manhattan, Stamford, Connecticut has become a white-collar hub of its own. Stamford is a very vibrant city. Its motto is the city that works. It's just very affluent, full of young professionals. The downtown is just saturated with Fortune 500 companies, startups, restaurants. You have waterways and suburbs. It's a beautiful place to live. But for one resident, that beautiful place turns ugly. Just after noon on a chilly November day, a woman dials 911 from the marina. Hello? Is this 911? Hello? A guy attacked my neighbor. It is a female caller relating that her neighbor was attacked and she saw a male. She can hear some screaming. Can you tell me what the guy looks like? I can't tell. I heard yelling. I heard yelling. And she gives an address. It's 123 Harbor View. 123 Harbor View. The address that the 911 caller gave was an industrial area and there were no residences there. So the dispatcher is trying to confirm that address and all of a sudden the 911 caller hung up. Hello? Based on the location of the Marina payphone, the dispatcher locates a similar sounding address less than a mile away. 123 Harbor Drive, which is in a section of the city called Uniformed Police Officer pulls up to the condo. He tries the door, which is unlocked, and he opens up that door and is now looking at a just a tremendously violent scene in the foyer there is a body of a female lying on her back. The young woman is dead. There's a lot of blood. She has been attacked. There's a dumbbell nearby that has obviously been used in the attack because it has blood on it. The responding officer starts notifying dispatch and also starts crime scene security. In other words, no one's coming in. He's just shutting down the entire area. Detective Greg Holt with the Stamford Police Department's major crime squad is tasked to lead the investigation. I arrive on scene. The CSI team start to process the crime scene, start to process the body. They're documenting it with photography, with measurements. They're dusting for prints. There is overturned furniture. There's potted plants, potting soil everywhere. The victim was stabbed in the face, in the neck, and in the chest. The stab wounds were interesting because you have that one in the face, which could have occurred during a struggle, or it could be there to disfigure that victim. The victim is Anna Lisa Raimondo, and this is her condo. The 32-year-old woman is an executive at a pharmaceutical company. A hair was located laying on the victim's chest. A single hair. That was collected. One of the detectives had entered the powder room and he noticed a minute drop of blood just below one of the handles to the faucet. And that was collected for future processing. There is no forced entry 
visible at the front door. It was more likely that the perpetrator had knocked on the door and the victim allowed the perp into the house. Why would you let someone into the house if you didn't know them? After their initial review of the crime scene, detectives have an idea what happened next. It is clear to us it's a blitz attack right there. It doesn't go upstairs. It was obvious that she fought for her life literally in that foyer and the perpetrator grabbed the barbell and struck her with it. And that may have stunned. When we see the wounds, it was almost like an overkill. She has hair ripped out and there's stab wounds all over her body. So you're running things through your head. Like who could have been this vicious to do this to this woman? With no immediate suspects, Detectives want to know who the 911 caller was that identified herself as Annalise's neighbor. We immediately sent down personnel to that payphone half a mile from the crime scene. It is a huge lead that there was a actual eyewitness to at least the beginning of this homicide. Police process the payphone for press. At a restaurant close to the phone, officers question patrons and staff. Did anyone see the mystery woman who made the call? Unfortunately, customers were coming and going, but no one saw anybody on the phone. And there was nothing to gain of evidentiary value from the phone or the receiver. While forensics technicians dig deeper into the crime scene, Detective Holt has the grim task of notifying the victims next of kin. Mr. and Mrs. Raimundo are obviously completely stunned. Detectives learned that Annalisa was a highly accomplished and successful young woman. Annalisa was a Harvard graduate. She went on to get her master's at Columbia, and then she started her career in the pharmaceutical business. Annalisa not only was very intelligent, but was very well liked. She was very athletic. She was a beautiful, stunning woman. Anybody that spoke about her always spoke about how nice she was, that she was bubbly and caring and very involved with family and friends. Mrs. Raimundo, the pleading that was in her eyes, she was begging us to find out what happened to their lovely daughter. To catch Annalisa's killer, Detective Holt must put together the last 24 hours of her life. Annalisa had called her mom at 1034 the morning of the homicide, didn't get in touch with her, but left a voicemail. That was very instrumental in narrowing that timeline down. So now we had 1034 to the time of the 911 call at approximately 12 p.m. as the window for this homicide occurring. Annalise's parents report their daughter had been working at home when the killer struck. Was this a robbery gone wrong? Annalise's pocketbook and possessions were still there. Didn't appear that anything was missing, so it didn't look like it was a robbery at that time. There's no evidence that the perpetrator went any further than that foyer. This is clearly a targeted attack. They went to that specific door and she allowed them into her house. The question is, neighbors start coming home from work, only to find their access blocked by the crime scene. It's dark and a car pulls in and a male white gets out and he wants to go home and he is asked, where do you live? He, he points towards our primary crime scene. He's identified as Nelson Sessler, boyfriend of the victim, Annalisa Raimundo. So now we know that we have to talk to this dude. We take him down to the station for what turns into a marathon interview overnight. In four out of five murder cases, the suspect and victim are known to each other. So in this case, you'd want to examine the intimate partner because they could be one of the most likely killers. The interesting thing is Nelson Sessler never asked, why are you at my house? Is Annalisa Raimundo okay? Is everything okay? All of the standard questions that a civilian might ask the police, particularly where they're intimately involved with somebody at that crime scene. He was very, not emotional. He was like very relaxed, which was very unusual. Clearly, there's so much more going on that he isn't being forthright about. And we just had to figure out what it was. Hour 
hours after the brutal murder of 32-year-old Annalisa Raimondo, Stamford detectives want to know if her boyfriend, Nelson Sessler, is the killer. Nelson says he wants to cooperate, but something's off about the way he's behaving. When we've disclosed to him that Annalisa was the victim of a homicide, there was no demonstrative, oh my gosh, what happened to her? No tears, just a deadpan individual. He was not appearing like he wants to help us with the investigation. If we asked him a question, we would get a yes or a no. Whatever information we are getting from Nelson Sessler, it's like pulling teeth. He would not volunteer anything. Eventually, after hours of interview, investigators are able to pull some information out of Nelson. We learn that he has a residence within the city of Stamford, but he also resides occasionally at Annalisa's condo. Nelson was a couple of years older than Annalisa. They had been dating pretty seriously for at least a year. They were talking about marriage. Did this young couple's love somehow end in murder? Investigators know that Annalisa was attacked sometime between 10.34 a.m. and 12 noon. Where was Nelson at that time? We learned that Nelson had... Nelson Sessler said he went to his office, stayed all day, did not leave for lunch. Then at the end of the day, drives home. If what he has told us is true, he would have been the last person to see her alive as he left for work and left her at the house. He tells us that he works at Purdue Pharma, which is a gigantic drug company. We also learn that Annalisa Raimundo worked at Purdue Pharma. The couple began dating as co-workers, but recently Annalisa moved on to a different company. Detectives wonder if the move sparked a change in the relationship. We asked him, are you dating anyone else? Do you have another girlfriend? Are you married? No, no, no. Annalisa's it. There was no other female involved in his life. According to Nelson, Annalisa was well-liked and had no enemies at work. But he was concerned about her behavior at home. He told Annalisa that she shouldn't walk in front of windows or be careful about somebody following her. Just be mindful of your safety. Somebody might see you parading in front of a window. Nelson suggests Annalisa may have been attacked by a peeping Tom. But Holt has already examined her condo, and Nelson's story doesn't ring true. What window are you talking about, Nelson? Unless you were across the way in another condo on the second floor, you couldn't see into her unit. It didn't make any sense. Holt wonders if Nelson is giving a false lead to point police in the wrong direction. I knew 100% that Nelson Sessler was not being truthful with us. I knew that he was lying to us about something. I knew that he was withholding information. I just didn't know what. If talking to Nelson doesn't reveal the truth, maybe the physical evidence will. Detectives know that Annalisa put up a big fight. If Nelson was her attacker, he'd likely have scratches, cuts, and bruises on his body. We had one of our CSIs come in and photograph him from the waist up without his shirt on, front and back, looking for any wounds, but we didn't see any scratches on him. We didn't see any marks on him. There was nothing to indicate that he had been in a fight. Nelson says he was at work, so investigators contact security at Purdue Pharma to check his alibi. Purdue Pharma has extremely tight security. Everything is closed circuit television, cameras. You have to swipe a card key wherever you go within the company. They pulled up all of their CCTV footage and showed him entering the parking garage that morning. They pulled up all of the computer records showing that he swiped his way into the building, entered his office, and then everywhere that he went within the Purdue Pharma facility that day, he was card swiping. He had approximately 8 a.m. until the time that he returned home in the same clothes that he left in. There's no way Nelson attacked and killed Annalisa. Holt is suspicious that Nelson is hiding something, but with no evidence against him, they have to let Nelson go. Investigators re-listen to the one piece of evidence they do have, the recording of the 911 caller. I saw a guy going to her apartment, and I was wondering if he had a view. 
They need to find the person who claimed to be a neighbor and a witness to the murder. Can you tell me what the guy looks like? Typically, when someone's calling from a payphone, it means that they don't want their own number or their own phone information to be recorded. It could also be that they're in close proximity to the killer and don't want to be overheard making the call or don't want people to know that they've come forward with information. We had a tape recording of the 911 call and we had been playing that at Purdue Pharma. We'd been playing it to folks around the condo that resided there, thinking maybe it was a housekeeper, maybe it was a babysitter. We were including that in our articles to have this person come forward and that did not happen. We exhausted every single avenue that we could think of to identify the 911 caller. And it was completely a dead end on all fronts. Canvassing Annalise's neighborhood doesn't help police find the 911 caller. But it does produce a terrifying new lead. An individual had been bragging, bragging about killing a woman, stabbing a woman with a knife. It was seen by someone that he had blood on a sneaker. We are now thinking this could be the perpetrator. Word on the street is the suspect is part of a gang of thieves who operate on the waterfront. Property Crimes was investigating boat burglaries out on the docks. Boat burglars were stealing high-end equipment off of the yachts board in the area where Annalisa lived. Because it is an affluent area, it definitely attracts criminals breaking into homes, stealing things from boats. As Stamford police work to identify the suspect, they get a call about a suspicious car seen in the marina on the day of Annalise's murder. There was a black car filled with saltwater fishing gear, brass instrumentation, probably stolen. The witness recorded the vehicle's license plate, which police are able to connect to a name. 41-year-old Gary Riley. Gary Riley was identified. He has a, a criminal record and a burglary warrant that was out on him. He had been seen on the docks the day of the homicide between... ...at the time of the murder. Now detectives wonder if he's also a killer. We had to go out and scoop him up as fast as possible. After the murder of Annalisa Raimondo, Stanford police are looking for the guy who said he did it, a known criminal named Gary Riley. We are talking to people, we're trying to locate him, and we heard eventually that he was holed up in a seedy motel. That's how he was ultimately located. We went down to the lockup and brought him up to the interview room. He's tweaking constantly because he's either high or he needs to get high. It doesn't take long for detectives to figure out what Gary knows about Annalise's murder. On top of being an obvious liar, Gary Riley just didn't know any details of it uh, other than what you could have learned on the news uh, in the newspaper. The more we talk to him, the more we are realizing that he is just a braggart. Incredibly, it seems that Gary was taking credit on the street for a murder he knows almost nothing about. Sometimes people want to cultivate a reputation so other people in the community are afraid of them. He tries to be bigger than what he actually is. When he's out there down the street, hey, look at me, I killed this person. I'm a pretty dangerous individual. Now, these are petty criminals, and they're not the brightest people on earth. Under interrogation, Gary smartens up and confesses to what he really saw when Annalisa was killed. Riley is telling us that he and his partner named Matt McCabe are on the docks burglarizing boats with a black auto filled with stolen high-end equipment. And they see all of the police activity and they're thinking, my God, somebody spotted us, they're after us. So they started fleeing the area. Gary escapes the scene on foot, but his partner Matt takes the car. Matt McCabe took off with that black auto. Gary Riley never saw the auto again. Gary Riley is saying, I didn't do it, but maybe he did it. Riley turned us on to Matthew McCabe. Gary Riley is charged with theft, but he played no part in Annalise's murder. We were able to conclude that other than being on the scene between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. during the commission of boat burglaries, Gary Riley was not involved in our homicide. Detectives turn their attention to Gary's partner in crime, Matt McCabe. 
Did Matt McCabe attack and kill Annalisa Raimondo? Detectives are wondering if Gary's accomplice, Matt, could be the real killer. No one can be eliminated as a suspect until they find him and his elusive car. We're thinking that Matt McCabe may have fled the jurisdiction. After weeks of searching, investigators find no trace of Matt McCabe in the vicinity. Then they get a lucky hit from 1,300 miles south in Fort Lauderdale. Matt McCabe was arrested in Florida, not in connection with our homicide at all. It was burglary of property crimes, and he had ended up being collared, and he was being held on bail. Detectives immediately travel to the Fort Lauderdale prison to question Matt McCabe. We interviewed him at length. He responded to our questions. He didn't lawyer up. He clearly admitted to being a burglar, but he said, I didn't have anything to do with this homicide. I didn't have anything to do with it. He allowed us to take a uh, buckle swab and head hair for comparison. Holt then asks about the black car McCabe used during his boat heists on the day of Annalise's murder. Matt McCabe told us that he had taken that car to a salvage yard, wrecking yard, and we're like, well, do you remember where? McCabe either can't remember where the vehicle is, or he doesn't want police to find it. The auto might contain evidence from the homicide if people that were in that auto had been involved in the commission of the homicide. So that's why we wanted to locate it and see if there was any forensic evidence in it, namely some blood. So we go to Fort Lauderdale Police Department and we ask them for a list of salvage yards in their jurisdiction. We get it and we're starting to canvas these yards. But we cannot locate the auto. It was probably scrapped and crushed. The mysterious black car is never found. But investigators do return to Stamford with McCabe's DNA to submit it to their lab for analysis. Is it a match to the hair and blood found at the crime scene? The Connecticut State Police Forensic Laboratory compared the samples that we took from Matt McCabe against DNA that was collected at the crime scene. And his buckle swab and hair did not match the recovered forensic evidence at the scene. Matt McCabe is eliminated as a suspect. Stanford police are no closer to finding who killed Annalisa. The police were feeling a lot of pressure to solve the case. The family was calling the newspaper all the time. They wanted justice for their daughter. The public wanted to know what was going on. I definitely think the police had a lot of pressure at that time. Four and a half months pass after Annalisa's murder, when the case suddenly breaks wide open. I arrive at the uh, squad room, and there is a female detective, Allison Carpentier, from Westchester County, New York, Police Department. Detective Allison Carpentier is a 14-year veteran homicide detective of the Westchester County Police Department. And I said, everybody thinks that I should come here and speak to you guys. I am kind of wondering, okay, well, what's going on? Detective Carpentier is working on an attempted murder case up in New York State that might be connected to someone in Holt's jurisdiction. Greg Holt is like, why would you think your investigation is involved with my investigation? And I tell him that we believe our investigation crosses over to a gentleman named Nelson Sessler. We believe that Nelson Sessler is involved with this woman who attempted to kill her husband. Nelson Sessler was also Annalisa Raimondo's boyfriend. And I said, Nelson Sessler, oh baby, here we go. I get a call from patrol sergeant and tells me that I need to respond over to a crime scene. It's in a parking lot. Upon arriving on our scene, we realize there's a victim, a male victim named Paul, that is in an ambulance being rushed into the emergency room for major surgery to save his life. At the scene itself is a woman. She's being held by patrolmen, and we learn that she had just stabbed her husband. The attacker is 33-year-old Sheila Davalu. Right after her husband gets out of surgery, we learn what happened. Him and his wife were playing a game. Sheila tells him that it would be fun, just something to make them be a little closer. Paul describes to us that their relationship has separated a little bit, and he was spending a lot of time at work, so he was very into playing this game with his wife. Sheila describes to him that she'll blindfold him and then put items up to his chest, and he can, you know, guess what they are. And uh, she starts to play this game with Paul. According to Sheila's husband, Paul, the game began innocently enough. Then 
suddenly he feels pain. Paul feels a very sharp object in his chest, and he says, what was that? And she's like, oh, it was the back of a candle. It has, like, a, a wire on it. And so he's like, oh, all right. I guess it wasn't that bad. But within minutes, he feels another thrust of the knife in his chest. Kayla claims it was an accident, but then she stabs him again. Paul's insisting at this point, please take me to the hospital. I'm bleeding. I need help. Sheila says she's calling for an ambulance, but they're too busy to respond. She tells Paul they can't come here. They're on a lot of emergencies. Eventually, Paul convinces Sheila to take him to the hospital. Instead of driving him to the emergency room, she drives him to a wooded area in the back of the parking lot. She stabs him again, and then she tries to drag him into the woods. Paul starts screaming, help me, help me, and then people that are in the parking lot come over, and they were able to help Paul and call for an ambulance. We bring Sheila Davila. We don't know if he's going to make it. It doesn't look good. We let her believe that. Because you want as much lies as you want truth when you're interviewing somebody. So Sheila's telling her little tale, thinking we're never going to find out the truth. She goes into this whole story of how Paul came home injured already. She rushes to get him some help. Detective Carpentier knows Sheila's lying. But she needs hard evidence to hold her in custody. So we start going through Sheila's phone. And we learn she didn't call 911 from that cell phone or the home phone. But she does call a person in her contacts right after she stabs her husband. Sheila calls Nelson Sessler and makes a date for that night. Nelson Sessler, Annalisa's reticent boyfriend, is now connected to Sheila Davalu tried to murder her husband. Detective Carpentier now wants to know if Nelson Sessler is also involved in that attempted murder. Me and my partner show up at uh, Nelson Sessler's apartment. We're knocking on the door. Nobody's answering. So we knock on a neighbor of his. A gentleman answers the door, and I said, uh, you know Nelson Sessler? He tells me yes. He goes, I know what this is about. This is about his girlfriend that was murdered. And I said, his girlfriend that was murdered? I don't know anything about that. He goes, well, then I think you need to get your answers from Stanford Police Department. So from Nelson's apartment, we drive over to Stanford Police Department. At Stanford Police Station, the detectives exchange information on their cases. I asked to see the crime scene photos. We're going through with them. When I looked at the crime scene in Stanford, I remember just saying, why is it such a bloodbath? Why is there hair pulling? Women pull hair. We kick, we pull hair. This was a cat fight. Detective Carpentier suspects the attacker might have been a woman. Suspicions are about to get stronger. They report to me that they have a 911 call from the day of their homicide. I said, can you do me a favor? Can I hear that 911 tape? I saw a guy go into her apartment. I'm, I'm a point behind of you. Immediately, because I had just interviewed Sheila for 12 hours straight, I, I said to them, I believe I know who that caller is. That person is Sheila Davalu. The mysterious 9 9- one caller is suddenly revealed, Sheila Davalu. She just tried to kill her husband, and now she's placed at a Stanford payphone, less than a mile from Annalisa's condo on the day Annalisa was killed. Sheila Davalu is now the prime suspect in the murder of Annalisa Raimondo. I'm thinking to myself, this person could have actually killed Annalisa. But if it was Sheila, investigators have no idea what might trigger such a vicious attack. Is Annalise's boyfriend, Nelson Sessler, somehow involved? I said, did Nelson ever mention a person named Sheila? Did, did they come up in your investigation? Sheila Davalu, at all. In the hours and hours and hours that we spent with Nelson Sessler, he was asked repeatedly, are there any other females in your life? He never volunteered Sheila Davalu. He was lying to us by omission and lying to us directly. And we wanted to know about his connection with Sheila Davalu. Investigators bring Sessler in again for questioning. They want to know about his relationship with Sheila Davalu. And this time, they need him to tell the truth. Are they friends? Why were you coming over there for dinner? Why does Sheila stab her husband and then make a call to Nelson? Is he part of it? Detectives find out there's a surprising connection. We learn that Nelson Sessler is a colleague of Sheila's. Sheila works at Purdue also. Annalisa, Nelson Sessler... Sheila Davalu all work together at Purdue Pharma. Nelson is telling me that him and Sheila are just friends, co-workers, they go out for drinks once in a while, and that since she has these two dogs, he helps her walk them. 
Detective Carpentier doesn't buy it. I just looked at Nelson in the eye and I said, Nelson, we know you're not driving from Connecticut to New York without getting laid. And then he finally admits that he's having an affair with Sheila. The fact that police pointedly questioned Nelson on who his exes were, but that Sheila was omitted entirely, it seems, for a reason. As though Nelson perhaps had some lingering concern back then uh, that she has something to do with this murder. To me, the omission appears deliberate. We did a search warrant on Sheila Davalu's condo. We are locating photographs of her and Nelson Sessler, tickets for a Giants football game, photograph on a, a ski trip. In her bedroom closet, they find something more sinister. We locate a box that housed night vision goggles. Now we're thinking, could she have been doing surveillance on Annalisa? That goes back to the comment by Nelson Sessler of parading in front of a window that people might see you. We're trying to put those two together. If Sheila was stalking Annalisa, was she acting alone? Or was Nelson in on it? I wonder if he knows that his girlfriend is doing surveillance on his girlfriend. Investigators have discovered that Annalisa Raimondo's boyfriend, Nelson Sessler, had a second relationship with a married woman, Sheila Davalu. Now detectives from two states need to determine if Sheila and Nelson conspired and executed a plan to murder Annalisa. While we were interviewing Nelson Sessler, he tells us that a couple years prior, at the time he was also seeing Annalisa, so he's seeing Annalisa and that he broke things off with Sheila and they remained friends. Nelson insists he was in a monogamous relationship with Annalisa at the time of her murder. He says that he hadn't seen Sheila and that he only started sleeping with her again after Annalisa died because Sheila was a big comfort to him. Nelson maintains that Sheila told him she was single. Nelson didn't believe that Sheila was currently married. Nelson Sessler later said that she was saying that she was divorced and she would invite him to dinner about once a week. Detectives find Nelson's story hard to believe. How could he have stayed at Sheila's house without knowing she was married and living with her husband? Remarkably, it's her husband, Paul, who corroborates Nelson's story. When she would invite Nelson over, she would clean out any pictures of her husband, and she would tell her husband that she was having her brother over. Now, her brother had some mental issues. Paul said that Sheila used the excuse that her handicapped brother would be sleeping over and he would be upset if he knew Sheila was married. So Paul thought he was being a good husband and would spend many nights out of the home so Sheila supposedly could have her handicapped brother sleep over. We learned that her brother has never stayed in her home and that those occasions she was having Nelson sleep over. The brother, quote unquote, was Nelson Sessler. It appears that Nelson was telling detectives the truth. Sheila was lying to both her husband, Paul, and to him. She was kind of covering all her bases, you know, like lying to Paul Christos, lying to Nelson Sessler. And I think at some point, maybe she just couldn't keep up this whole charade anymore. Detectives contact security at Purdue Pharma, this time to track the movements of Sheila Davalu on the day Annalisa was murdered. We learned that at 10.53 a.m. on the morning of the homicide, Sheila Davalu leaves the property of Purdue Pharma. At 1.53 p.m., Sheila Davalu re-entered the property of Purdue Pharma and went back to work. She was on CCTV and she had to use her card to get to the garage to get her car. Not only did detectives know that Sheila was out of the office during the time of the murder, her cell phone records also reveal where she went. Sheila Davalu's cell phone showed that she pinged within the confines of Stamford, right near Annalisa's condo. The tracking data puts Sheila at the crime scene at the time of Annalise's murder. But there's one final piece of evidence against Sheila that proves the most damning. The drop of blood below the faucet handle in the powder room at Annalise's condo, the DNA comes back to Sheila Davila. We knew we had her. Investigators are finally able to piece together the events in the final 24 hours that led to Annalisa Raimondo's murder. They both get up in the morning, 8 o'clock, give or take. Nelson Sessler subsequently leaves for work around 8.30. At 10.34 a.m., Annalisa 
makes a phone call to her mom, does not get her mom on the phone, but leaves a message. At 10.53 a.m., Sheila Davila leaves the building where she works. Between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m., Sheila Davila walks up to Annalisa's apartment, knocks on the door, and obviously Annalisa opens it. We believe that Sheila took Annalisa by surprise, and that's where the attack starts. At approximately 12 p.m., Sheila Davalu makes a 911 call into the Central Dispatch Center for the City of Stamford Police Department, indicating that her friend had been attacked by a male. Hello. A guy attacked my neighbor. At 1.53 p.m., Sheila Davalu re-enters her workplace at Purdue. At 4 o'clock, while at work, she actually leaves Nelson a voicemail on his phone, telling him to have a good weekend. Sheila Davalu killed Annalisa Raimondo because she was interfering with her relationship with Nelson Sessler. The only way to get her out of the picture in her mind was to kill her. She planned this. She knew what she was going to do. This is about winning and losing to people like this. Sheila's ongoing obsession with Nelson, whereby she is simultaneously fixated on him and reveres him and... At the same time, she's prepared to take extreme steps to make sure she wins, and she will take and have what she wants. In the weeks following Annalisa's death, Sheila rekindles the relationship with Nelson, who has no idea she is Annalisa's killer. Well, I believe Sheila would have gotten away with the murder of Annalisa had she not attempted to kill her husband. Sheila Davalu was convicted in New York State for the attempted homicide of her husband. She was sentenced to 25 years in New York State Prison. She was convicted as well in the city of Stamford for the homicide of Annalisa Bremundo. Sentencing for that was 50 years. So for all intents and purposes, she has life in prison. There's no such thing as closure for a homicide victim's family. It's with them for the rest of their life. They lost a wonderful human being. Annalisa's loss was so sad. She was so loved by her friends and family. She had such a bright future. She was just beginning to come into her own. Such a life cut so short.